They preferred to have an insane man running about screaming in all hours of the night, cutting himself, who was so dangerous that they saw the need to bind him and they could not, that they tried to fetter and they could not, who was running around the tombs that their family are buried in, to in desecrating the same. And he's possessed with so many evil spirits that it is referred to the spirit uh, that spoke uh, for the evil spirits referred to them as a legion. And they're more concerned that there is this individual who has cast out the devils in their country than they are that they're in this grave danger. You know, I believe that we as Christians many times are more concerned about what would happen if we were to live dedicated, sanctified, holy lives. We're more concerned about the loss that we would suffer. We're more concerned about the shame and the reproach that would come from being Christ-like than we are about the fact that people are going to hell. And here is a whole nation, a whole country that's a territory of evil spirits. And what they needed more than anything else was for the Son of God to drive them out. And they requested that He would leave those parts. I want to say to you, Christian, I want to remind you that there are two reactions that we can have to God's power and God's work. The first is, God, please stop. God, please stop. And I want to tell you, God's willing to do a work. I don't for a minute believe that, uh, that we have got some kind of a mysterious thing that we've got to wait on to see God work. God just begins to work. Hey, when the, the first time God's Holy Spirit spoke to you, do you invite Him to? I mean, were you just such a good person that you just said, you know what, I think I've got a problem with sin, and God, I'd invite you to convict me about it. No, the first time that uh, God dealt with you about sin, it wasn't because you requested Him to. And I, you say, Pastor, no, no, I was really... Now, you don't, you, you're, you're thinking it's cloudy. God revealed your sin to you, and He did it as a favor. You don't have to wait. You don't have to ask God to work for Him to begin to do a work. And that's evident in your life, isn't it? Hey, when the gospel was preached to you, is it because it was at your request? No. It was because God brought you conviction. And when the gospel was preached, you received Jesus because you saw your need for the Savior. And that's the kind of work God does. God is, Jesus Christ is always reaching out. Hey, the folks in the gatherings didn't invite Jesus to come over. He came to them. Amen. They didn't say, hey, uh, why don't you come into our country? We've got a problem with a man. Jesus went over and he reached that man. And so the first reaction that we see to the power of God is that they request him to go away. You say, Pastor, I can't imagine ever doing that. Christian, I think that we do it more often than we think. That, that matter of the sin of quenching God's Holy Spirit, I believe happens by believers, not by the lost. And I think it happens in the churches, not outside. And the matter of restricting God and limiting His ministry and asking, say, Jesus, no, that's not the kind of ministry we want in our church. That's not the sort of thing we need happening. You know what we need happening in our church? We need to have some family ministry. We need to have some, we need to have, and we, we describe all the things that a church ought to have in order to be a good place for us to go. But you know what we don't require? The power of God. You know what we don't require? The sweet presence of God's Holy Spirit. You know what we don't require? The power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're willing to do without a lot of those things. And you know what? In our way, I think many times we request Him to leave us alone. I say, Pastor, I would never think so. Hey, have you always responded to Bible conviction about sin? When God's Holy Spirit convicts you about something, what's your response? Is it to go to your knees and to give it to the Lord? Or is it to say, Lord, not now? Or Jesus, you know, that's, you know, that's not the level of Christian. You know, the different Christians all determine how far they're going to go. They really do. You know what God wants from us? Everything. He wants total surrender. But you know, a lot of Christians decide how much God can have. Just how far they'll take it. Just how deep into their family. Just how much into their personal affairs and their life and their finances and so forth. And I'll just tell you, we're a lot like a group of people that have seen the power of God and said, you know, why don't you leave us alone? Why don't you leave us alone? But you know, there's a contrast to it, and it's in the least likely place in the world. There's a contrast to that attitude. It's the least likely place. Look at this. In verse um, 18, the Bible says, when he was coming to the ship, they asked him to leave, and what did Jesus do? He left. And when he was coming to the ship, the Bible says... He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. There was one individual in that countryside that didn't want Jesus to leave. There was one individual in that countryside that was glad Jesus had come. And that was the individual who had been responsible for the terror there, who had been responsible uh, for all this evil, and he had, had, uh, he, had, he had been saved. 
He had God's power in his life. And he said, Jesus, can I go with you? Can I go with you? And Christian, I think that this you'll find very interesting. How many individuals ask Jesus if they can follow him that he says no? Do you remember the rich man that came to Jesus? He came, he, he, we'll see it here shortly in the book of Mark. He comes to Jesus and, and he, he, he bows on his knees and he says, uh, he says, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, well, you need to keep all the laws. He said, I've done it. And Jesus said, well, then go sell all your possessions and come and follow me. And we went sorrowful because he had much goods. He, he couldn't do it. He didn't want to follow Jesus. You know, most Christians don't want to follow Jesus. But here's a man that said, Jesus, can I follow you? And Jesus, what did he tell him? He said, stay where you're at. Can you remind you of the place where Jesus told this man to stay? Verse 19, how be it Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for them and hath had compassion on thee. Here is a man that wants to come with Jesus and he wants to follow him. Why do you think the man would want to do that? Because it's just the safest place in the world to be around Jesus. Here he has been, and it is isn't amazing that God in his mercy had had compassion on this man and spared his life. During the time when he had evidently welcomed evil spirits into him. And now he's been bound and he's been enslaved by them and had not been able to get free. And Jesus has set him free. All he wants to do is be with Jesus. And Jesus tells him, go home, tell your friends, and tell your family how that God's had compassion on you. You know what this is a reminder to me of? It's a reminder of our personal calling. It's a reminder of our personal calling. See, Christian, you're supposed to preach Jesus in Jerusalem. You're supposed to preach Jesus in Jerusalem. You know, I, I think I mentioned this last week when we first started our church. There were individuals that used to live in Fort Lauderdale, many of them that sent us emails and said, you know, I wish that church had been there before I moved away. We had to move away because it was just such a wicked area. It just wasn't a good place to raise kids and raise a family. It just wasn't a good place for us to be, and so we moved away. But if your church had been there, maybe we wouldn't have had to move away. Do you know, Christian, that that's not the right reason to move away? And I want to tell you something, believer. You ought to have an attitude toward wickedness that it's not tolerable. You ought to be a very intolerant of sin. Christians oughtn't to be politically correct about wickedness. And that's a fact. But do you know what Jesus told this man who thought that the best thing to do would be to isolate himself and put himself in a kind of place where there was no evil? There was no evil around Jesus, believe me. Oh, there were wicked sinners that were surrounding him, but I'm telling you, coming from Jesus, there was no evil. There was a great place of protection. He wanted to be there, and Jesus told him, he said, go home. Where did he tell him to go home to? The very place where individuals had asked Jesus to leave because they didn't want his kind of a spirit. The kind of place that is surrounded by evil demon spirits. Do you think that the, devil, the, the devils died with the swine when they went into the sea? No, friend. They probably entered into the crowd that came to see Jesus and asked him to go away. See, the devils were welcome there. But the Son of God wasn't. Not ought to concern you, Christian, if Jesus isn't welcome in the area where you live. Not to bother you. Hey, listen, we don't need to move to some place where uh, the, the gospel is a welcome thing. It shouldn't bother you to have a little reproach and a little shame. By the way, I'm glad at the reception of the gospel by the lost. You know, in every crowd of gatherings, there's a man like this man who wants to be free. Hey, I'll tell you something. Thank God for living in an area where drugs are rampant, where violence is well known. Thank God for living in an area where sin is open. You say, Pastor, isn't that the kind of thing we ought to preach against? It sure is. But you wouldn't have much to preach about if it wasn't for sin. Oh, come on now. now. I'm serious about that. Thank God for being in this city and this kind of a place. And I want to ask you a question. What kind of a spirit do you have about you? And I'm not asking this morning if you've got an evil demon spirit living in you. I don't believe that that's true in this place. I believe Jesus would expose you. But I'm asking you what kind of a spirit you have in the spirit of man. You want to go out and see God do a great work? Or would you just rather things just kind of stayed like they were and everything wasn't shook up? And you know that when God works, things get shook up a little bit. Evil gets exposed. And when evil gets exposed, uh, God's spirit begins to work in power. And, the, and, and God's people can have one of two attitudes. We can say, you know, Jesus, 
This isn't what we were looking for. You see, what I wanted was a safe, comfortable place to raise kids. What I wanted was, you know, a, a nice neighborhood uh, where things are just quiet and peaceable. And, you know, these people are so messed up that they preferred a man who had an evil spirit in him to the Son of God. And that spirit, many times, can be in Christians, can be in believers. I'm not talking about the evil spirit. I'm just talking about an attitude that says, you know, that's going too far. Do you know that every Christian who lives for God gives God everything? And God has preeminence in every aspect, area of his life. He doesn't ever question or argue what he has to do. You know, what of a Christian that says, well, you don't have to? Is that the attitude of somebody who loves God? Well, I can be right with God and not. And that's the attitude in this place. It's like, well, you know, things aren't so bad here. This is good enough. And they have a contented attitude. And they're content to have evil surrounding them everywhere. But yet there is one individual who the Bible says in verse 20 departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. And I want to point this out to you. They ran Jesus out, but they didn't run out the man who had the Spirit of God in him. I mean, you say, Pastor, I don't believe in the universal indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. Well, I do. What? You mean this man? No, I believe that God didn't just call this man to do something, to preach the gospel. I believe he gave him the power to do so. You remember when Jesus sent out his disciples two by two? What did he do? He gave him power. He gave him power over evil spirits. He gave him power to cast out demons. He gave him power to heal sicknesses. And here's a man that I believe has received power. And he goes to Decapolis and he begins to preach the gospel and the people marvel. It's a marvel. The Bible says all men did marvel. And they ran Jesus out of the country, but they didn't run this man out. You know what happened? People came to Christ. You say, Pastor, if Jesus came to Fort Lauderdale, I think that the mayor of our city would meet him and run him away. That's probably true. I think if Jesus came to Fort Lauderdale, uh, the ecumenical Christians uh, wouldn't want his kind of gospel. And I think that's probably true. You say, Pastor, if Jesus were to come to Fort Lauderdale, the kind of religion that he would require would be 100%. And most of the Christians in churches like ours wouldn't be comfortable with it. And I would say to you, it's probably true. But I just want to tell you something. When Jesus comes into your life and God's power delivers you from evil, and some people there's something that happens that makes men marvel. Boy, it's high time we start preaching the gospel to the wicked. Hey, uh, do you believe that a, that a drunken drug addict that is perverted and destroyed by sin could have God's power in his life and preach the gospel in a way to make men marvel? Hey, I, I'll tell you something. The bums on the street have got more potential in this city than the people that own the swine herds. They all need to be saved. And they all need the gospel preached to them. And we ought to do it. We ought to understand that there are two kinds of an attitude, even for Christians, that you could have. And the one would be, well, God, you know, we just we don't need that kind of a radical religion. And on the other hand, there could be individuals that would say, you know what? Look what God's done in my life and preach the gospel in power. And men will marvel about it. Amen. And people will come to Christ. I believe that's the ministry God wants to work. Uh, Jesus didn't need to go to Decapolis because he had a representative going there for him. You know what? Uh, Jesus is in heaven and he's making intercession for us, we learn from the scripture. He's praying for us before God the Father. But you know who's supposed to preach the gospel and make men marvel in Fort Lauderdale? We are. Us. We are. And that's true of you wherever you're from. Wherever you dwell. You know who's supposed to be a light for Jesus Christ in your neighborhood? The person that lives in front of your driveway. You are. And you know who's supposed to preach the gospel and to be a testimony for Christ in your family? And among your friends. Hey, Pastor, I wish you'd come and I wish you'd share the gospel with my, with my family. I'd be glad to. Have you done it yet? I'd be glad to preach the gospel to your family. Have you? Hey, Pastor, I'd just like them to you know, come and tell them what could be different in their lives after Jesus saves a person. Have they been able to see it in your life? I'd be glad to tell them. But what about you? And Jesus didn't see the need 